This video is one in a series commemorating the discovery of a fundamental particle that scientists call the Higgs boson. Now scientists and mankind have spent a lot of time and money trying to discover the Higgs boson. In fact, as far as money is concerned, it was nine billion dollars plus. Now we're sort of a practical people and we might rightly ask, what is the payoff for all this money that was spent? How are we going to make this thing pay us back? What is the benefit to mankind of all this work and all this money? Well, I want to explain that in this video. Quite briefly, what the scientists did in Geneva, Switzerland, with their Large Hadron Collider, this nine plus billion dollar device, is that they verified a theory they verified a theory that was, was derived in 1964 by Peter Higgs and his team. Now, I need to explain what a theory is in science. We throw the word theory around in our average language, but when we say it, we we're, we're mostly mean a conjecture. This is just a theory of mine. Uh, it, it means that we're not necessarily sure of something. In science, a theory is a very complete and a very deep picture of something. Sometimes they call it a model or a mathematical model. The theory has a lot of moving parts in it. It's got an explanation for things and it's got equations and relationships. Now what you can do with a theory is you can make predictions and that's the important part. I want to show you what I mean. Let's say we have a black box and there's a shaft going in one side and a shaft coming out the other side. Now let's say I can't see the internal workings of this black box, but I spin the shaft going in and I notice that the shaft going out spins twice as fast as the shaft going in. Now I can come up with a theory based on that. I can theorize that there's two gears inside this box and that the gear on the shaft that's coming in is, has twice as many teeth on it as the gear on the shaft that goes out. I don't know that for sure, but it's a working theory. The reason it's a theory is because I can make a prediction. I can predict that if I spin that shaft at 3 RPM, the outgoing shaft will spin at 6 RPM. If I spin the shaft going in at 5 revolutions per minute, the shaft going out will spin at 10 revolutions per minute. If this relationship does not hold true, if something were to change, for instance, I spin the shaft again at 10 revolutions per minute, and the shaft going out spins only at 12 revolutions per minute, I've disconfirmed my theory. I know that it's wrong. I know it can't just simply be two gears as my original theory had hypothesized. Now it's this ability of a theory to make a prediction that's crucial. The prediction is sort of a compass for both the scientist and both the engineer to develop new theories for the scientist and for the engineer to develop new technologies. Without this compass, the solution space is just too big. Nothing will point the way you'll be left floundering and just running random experiments. Sure, you'll find stuff, you'll, you'll stumble into things, but you're not going to make the kind of progress that you make if you have a theory. Take, for instance, the Higgs boson. Now, this is a chart of the energies that came out of the experiment that the Atlas team did at the Higgs boson. You'll notice this tiny little bump. The bump seems easily discernible now, but that's only because they ran trillions and trillions of experiments, um, 40, between 40 and 100 billion experiments per second over, uh, over years in order to collect enough data that they could find this little bump of energy. There's a physicist named Sean Carroll who described it as finding hay in a haystack. But in order to do this, 
They needed to know where to look. If they didn't know where to look, they never would have found the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was predicted by the theory. But the theory is even more important to technologists. Let me explain what I mean. Go back 5,000 years in your imagination. Let's go back. We're now at the beginning of the Bronze Age. Well, mankind was learning to work with bronze. And what were they doing? The, uh, copper and tin and maybe some other things in the alloy melted fairly easily at a low temperature. And we learned to work with this. We made some beautiful objects. We made weapons, swords, and spears out of bronze. What they had was know-how. This know-how was being passed from generation to generation, from father to son, from master to apprentice. And this went on for 2,000 years. Now, fast forward 2,000 years, and we're at the beginning of the Iron Age. Our ancestors are learning how to make things out of iron and alloys of, uh, of iron and steel. If you had a sword made of bronze and you came up against somebody who had a sword made of steel, you were at a distinct disadvantage. Steel was stronger and more flexible. There were even some people who became very good at it. Apparently Damascus steel was excellent and sought after if you had enough money. Somehow they figured out how to get most of the carbon out of the steel and it made it very strong and flexible. Fast forward another 2,000 years. Now you're at the Enlightenment and you're beginning to get into the modern age. And this is where things really take off. Now, I have a question for you. Why did it take 2,000 years between each of these epochs? Why, 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 did, uh, why, why is development happening so fast now, but it took 2,000 years to figure out your way from bronze to steel? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because our ancestors didn't have a theory. All they were doing was experimenting and discovering things by trial and error. Can you imagine how many dangerous and expensive experiments you have to do to figure out what you need to put into steel? Nowadays they put in nickel and manganese and cobalt and t titanium and chromium. And it, how do you know how much of those things to put in? Well, it's because we have very good theories about the crystal structures of metal and we, ha we know what's going to happen when we make adjustments to it and we can make predictions and we can see exactly what atoms have to go into it to do what. And we don't have to just try it and test it. We can figure this out because our theories make good predictions. Fast forward now to the age we're in and look at the products that come out and think about how the theories fit into these products. Our theories are crucial in the production of drugs, energy systems, computers, which use miniaturized microcircuits and transistors, completely involving um, the semiconductor physics, systems that we use to travel around the globe. The transistor is near and dear to me. I grew up with the transistor and I've seen it develop. And it reminds me a lot of the kind of thing that's happened with metallurgy and, the, and uh, how more advanced things are than they would have been in the Middle Ages. Transistors depend on a junction, typically called the NP junction because a negative and a positive um, set of charges are being exchanged over this junction. And to make the N material, it's usually silicon, and they put small impurities in of phosphorus or arsenic and even other things. And the P uh, material that's on the other side of the junction, they use boron and gallium to, and other uh, elements. Now, how would you know what elements to use and how much? You can't do this without a theory. Without a theory, we wouldn't have all the wonderful electronic uh, systems that we have now. I don't think we'd have ever gotten miniaturized. Uh, we'd still be possibly using vacuum tubes. Lasers have made a big contribution to society. If you do any communication on the World Wide Web, in fact, if you're watching this video now on a computer that's connected to the web, the signal that's carrying the video and the, uh, and the audio that you're listening to came across fiber optics 
that behavior is based on our, our theory. And of course, the lasers themselves, we would never have the transistors and the lasers and the computers and the superconductors that we have today without quantum field theory. Theories of subatomic particles and the behaviors of waves and fields within materials. Our theories on how superconductors work have driven all the wonderful things that have come out of that. And med medical imaging equipment would be nowhere without superconducting magnets. The global positioning satellites and communication satellites that we have come to depend so heavily on, in fact, all of astrophysics, owes its very existence to the theories that mankind has developed that point us in the direction that we need to be in order to develop these marvelous systems and realities. So that's the payoff. I can't tell you where it's going to go. All I can say is, every single technology that we have that makes our life wonderful and comfortable owes its existence to the fact that there's a theory of chemistry or physics or subatomic physics or whatever theory science might hold it's it's there and it points us in the direction we need to go in order to develop our technologies now one interesting thing in this whole verification process in at the uh, large hadron collider scientists were pretty sure they were going to find the higgs boson that's why they spent the $9 billion on this device, and that's why they were able to convince people. This represented the capstone, just, uh, but without doing the experiment, we, it was still in the area of metaphysics or a hypothesis. We needed to see some evidence of this Higgs boson. Even though the theory was so beautiful, it wasn't there yet until we actually saw the bump in the energy curve. Now we're more convinced. But it could have gone the other way, and scientists were prepared for that. It's possible we would not have seen evidence for the Higgs boson. Or maybe it would have been weirder than we thought it would be. Maybe it would have been uh, somehow uh, the energy would have been smeared out or the bump wouldn't have been in the right place. Well, that would have been okay too. It would have been interesting. We'd have had to go back to our theory and revise it. But that's what this is all about. We want our theory to be as perfect as possible. And we do need to uh, realize that there's a lot that hasn't been discovered. There's dark energy and dark matter in the universe, and possibly some of the quirks that we're going to discover with this equipment in the future is going to explain what that's all about, because right now we really don't understand it. We just know, once again, that it should be there based on what we know about reality now but we haven't seen it and we don't know what it is. So anyway, check out some of the videos in this series. I explain the Higgs boson. Uh, in this one, I explained what it, its payoff directly to mankind in sort of a greedy way, but it also has a big payoff as far as understanding who we are and our place in the universe. That's sort of the scientific end of things, and I think that needs to be explained, and, and uh, we also need to commemorate that, too. Thank you for listening.